Hello guys, this is Trinity Storm here and welcome back to my channel. Today, I'm going to do 7th part of Naruto the Evolution Bloodline. If you enjoy this video, please like, share and subscribe to my channel. Now wasting no more time, let's start the story. Orochimaru was enraged. This much was certain. He was finally falling asleep after the brat refused his power, and he was already having nightmares. It all started when he tried to eat Anko in his white snake form. He still wanted her, even though he didn't feel the same way he did for her. Then a bloody nine-tailed fox appeared from behind and devoured him. It devoured him. Orochimaru then awoke with a start and excruciating pain, as if he had been devoured. He had the same feeling when Naruto K. No, the brat, the damnable brat, refused him. Orochimaru screamed in agony as his entire body felt like it was on fire. Orochimaru reached up to his fangs, as if by instinct, to find the storage of his poison for the cursed seal. Nothing. It wasn't even empty. It was just burned away. Orochimaru raged, half a dozen years of hard work gone in an instant. Damn you, brat. Damn that blonde, blue-eyed brat. Damn it. Damn the seventh layer of hell for rejecting him. Anko was in pain, and that was about all she knew at the time. Nothing mattered any longer. Time, scent, touch, taste, or position. It was only her pain. The snake charmer's pain gradually subsided after what seemed like an eternity. Anko slowly opened her eyes, the pain and stiffness still present. She started to take in her surroundings. Check. Soft bed. Check. Blanket. Check. Complete darkness. The smell confirmed that she was in her room. Smell? She was dazed with thought. Yes, she could smell it, smell herself, the scent permeating the room, providing her with much needed security. She slowly raised her hand to the indentation on the wall and pulsed her chakra. A large sum arrived, much more than she was used to. Not only that, but it came easily, she assumed. It flowed much more easily than it had previously, when she had to actively push it. She didn't have time to think about it because the lights went on and Anko screamed in agony. Her eyes were filled with searing, white pain. What the hell did she do? Do you want to play, glare, with the sun or something? Anko realized a lot about herself as her eyes adjusted to her surroundings. She felt more at ease, the desire for blood almost completely gone. Her chakra flowed freely, willingly obeying her every command. Her muscles felt like a finely tuned machine, as if she could easily jump up to the Hokage monument and back down. Her senses heightened, and she was able to pick out every detail in the room. Even the minor, almost imperceptible pains she had as a result of her job as a shinobi, the pains that marked her dangerous life, had vanished. Anko inhaled deeply and almost gasped in surprise. She could smell the food she had eaten two days before. Of course, most of it was dango, but she could tell the difference just by smell. Dango, yum. Anko got back on track and attempted to get up, shaking her head. She got up easily enough, as expected. What surprised her was when she attempted to make room for her trench coat. Anko looked up, surprised. When did she arrive there? She was sitting on her bed one moment and twenty feet away next to her trench coat the next. She was even more surprised to discover that she could see perfectly during her near instantaneous transition. There is no blurred vision, no lost time, no tunnel vision, nothing. Everything was as sharp as it had been when she hadn't moved at all. Anko walked to the door in her trench coat, hoping to get some answers from the blonde blob of energy she called Otouto, even if she never said it aloud. Anko opened the door, nearly colliding with Hanada, who was carrying a large tray of food at the time. It appears that the poor girl wanted to bring her food. Anko's drool nearly turned into a river. She hadn't felt so hungry in a long time. Anko gulped the saliva down quickly, looking at Hanada the way a starving tiger would see someone keeping food away from it. 
Hinata, wisely, handed her the tray and stepped back. The Grand Battle of Anko vs. Food Tray began immediately, with Anko completely demolish the mighty food tray. When the big fight was over and Anko had cleaned herself up enough to look presentable, she picked up the tray and went to the dining room, where she could smell even more food. Anko began salivating once more. When Anko entered the dining room, everyone's attention was drawn to her. Hinata had already made her a second serving of breakfast. Naruto gave her a friendly smile before swallowing his food and speaking to her. Nei chan hello there. What are your thoughts? I hope the furball didn't bother you too much. Please take a seat and order some more food. You're going to need it. Anko didn't need to be told twice before digging in. She would have been astounded by how much she ate if she was capable of thinking beyond food now. She ate quickly, without even feeling full. And the food was delicious. It was the best she'd tasted in a long time, her tongue tingling with the various flavors. When Anko had calmed her rumbling stomach enough after more than an hour of crazed feeding, she cast a questioning glance at Naruto. What's going on, Gaki? I no longer recognize myself. How did you find the unsealing? Naruto gave her a warm smile before responding. Well, Anko, I'm pleased to report that everything went swimmingly. I managed to break your seal and connect Kiyubi to you. Given that you now share my Keke Jenke, he should have greatly improved your body. Even if you have a different perspective. Kiyubi gave me a penchant for foxes, while you have a penchant for snakes. You will most likely develop different abilities, but everything else will remain the same. You're now my sister. My younger sister. With that last statement, Naruto gave Anko a mischievous grin. Naruto continued, ignoring the daggers Anko threw at him. The point is that Kiyubi reversed all of the negative effects of the stupid seal and restored your body to its original state. Of course, that was unpleasant, but it should pass. That explains some things, but how long have I been sleeping? I ate almost my entire body weight in pancakes, dango, eggs, and onigiri. Really, brat. What else is happening? To begin with, you only slept one night. Kiyubi wasted a lot of energy by jump starting our bloodline, which you just got back by chomping down all that food. Don't worry, our metabolism is insane. Nothing is wasted, and you don't gain fat. You're going to have to cut back on the dango and eat a lot more meat now. Whether we like it or not, it is now necessary for us. You'll also need to practice chakra control, primarily to get a better feel for it. Kiyubi told me that your seal had really messed you up. He said you couldn't draw more than half your chakra safely. You'll probably need a day or two to readjust now that you're fixed. Your reflexes and senses come next. We have sharp senses like the Inazuka, but ours cover the entire collection. You'll have to work on them a little more, Kiyubi says, because you've subconsciously tuned them down to avoid sensory overload. Last but not least, it's strength training. If you thought we'd be the only ones training, you'd be mistaken, Nei Chan. You just opened a can of whoop ass and now you have to learn how to use it properly. It will, however, be entertaining. Well, for me, because you'll just get beaten up. Naruto's face was etched with a feral grin that made everyone cringe. Don't worry, Nei Chan. I'm not going to kill you. Hopefully. Unfortunately, you will not be able to use chakra while I am going all out against you. Are you ready for boot camp from hell? The wahahaha. This time, Team 8 as a whole laughed at Anko's misfortune. Or at least until Naruto intervened. What are you laughing about? We'll work twice as hard. We can't let my adorable little sister outperform us, can we? Naruto's statement was met with groans. Naruto, it was little known, enjoyed training as much as, if not more than, Lee. Couple that with a sadistic sibling who was obviously rubbing off on him, and he redefines the term, rough love. How are we going to train now? B. 
Because of his youthfulness, Kiba drew shouts from Lee. This time, Zabuza responded. For the first week, we'll exhaust you with physical training and chakra control. You'll choose your own weapon at the start of the second week and have Wonder Brat here improve it. Zabuza made a motion towards Naruto. Then comes the specialized training. Tenten will most likely train with me, Kiba with Haku, and Lee with Naruto, as he's the only one who can handle Yabrat. Tenten interrupted them all at that point because she had just realized Zabuza had said something about picking their own weapon and Naruto would be improving it. She jumped at him, grabbing his hands and repeatedly asking him what he'd make for her. Of course, the event made everyone sweat, except Lee, who was screaming about flames of youth. Zabuza was irritated by the interruption but carried on. Shino will most likely train with Anko, while Hinata will train with Kurenai. Of course, the opposite is also true. After you've finished here, we'll begin with a good warm-up while Naruto shows his Imouto the ropes. The glare made Zabuza laugh. So, once your stomachs have settled, let's get started. We've got a lot of work to do, so keep up. An hour of relaxation and random conversations passed before Naruto stood up, followed by Anko. Imouto chan come on. Allow your Aniki to demonstrate the works. As Anko screamed bloody murder, Naruto had no choice but to flee. Naruto escorted Anko to their usual dojo. He came to a halt and nearly stopped her with one hand. Okay, sis, let's get to work on a few things. We'll begin with wall walking and progress to chakra control exercises. Remember, you now have more than twice your chakra, so don't push it, okay? Then it's reflexes training, and I hope you're up for it or your trench coat will be dust. Anko mumbled slightly before beginning the chakra control training. Of course, having done them before, it was second nature to her. It was simply tedious to repeat them all. The ease with which the chakra flowed outwards, on the other hand, never ceased to amaze her. She felt raw power at her fingertips and realized how badly Orochimaru had screwed her over. She was almost to the top of the wall when she heard a voice in her head. Looky here, Chibi Hubby Chan has pretty good control. It doesn't appear to be a waste of time. Anko yelped in surprise before losing control and collapsing on her ass. As a camera flash blinded Anko, Naruto on the other side of the dojo laughed. Anko tripping over herself during basic chakra control? Priceless. Gaki, what the fuck? What was that ruckus? Naruto laughed even harder before attempting to speak. That was most likely. He he he. Kiyubi. Ha ha ha. Oh god my ribs. Ki Kiyubi? What the hell happened? What did you do to me, you damned thing? Anko was officially terrified. It's not every day that you learn a demon lord, no, the demon lord can speak to your mind. I had to infuse you with Yukai in order to break the seal. Kyubi's Yukai follows him wherever he goes. He can be annoying at times, but when he has something to say, you better pay attention because there will always be a reason that, or he may decide to play a prank on you. You'll never know. The fox is far too talented for it. He's also a jerk. If he starts complaining, enter your mindscape and create some vixens or family-sized rabbits for him. He'll stop talking. Oh, that's wonderful. In my head, I have a perverted, perpetually hungry giant demon fox. Meanwhile, I must begin chakra control from the beginning. Whoop d fucking do. Naruto laughed at his sister's antics before assisting her with her exercises. Meanwhile, Zabuza was torturing. Air, training the remaining rookies. Even Lee had grown tired of the sadistic journal. What was the high point of it all? He forced Kurenai and himself to complete the training. Her expression was extremely amusing. Nonetheless, she swallowed her curses and followed the rest. Zabuza worked them to the bone with everything from running circles around a forest clearing to push-ups, 
sit-ups, crunches, and whatever else he could think of. Even he was getting a good workout, which was saying a lot. He was pleasantly surprised by the genin, who were able to keep up. They grumbled, of course, but they didn't give up and quit. They kept going, no matter how tired they were. This was a lot of fun. Naruto had his sister sharpen her reflexes the next day. Taking a page from her playbook, he did it by throwing tens of kanai at her at random intervals and from various angles. When you combine a kanai cage bunshin with Naruto's reserves, you get a training regimen that would leave most junin dizzy. At the very least, Anko recognized and loved the regeneration she received. She could be skewered one minute and jump right back up the next. Things became difficult for Anko on the third day. It was time for her to practice her keke jenke, which meant a no-holds-barred fight with Naruto. Mostly no-holds-barred, because Anko was forbidden from using her chakra, putting her at a severe disadvantage. Anko swung her fists at Naruto. Naruto simply leaned back to an incredible extent before his right foot rose from beneath Anko and threw her back. He then did a handstand and improved it with a spinning kick before jumping up and riding himself. With sadness, he looked at Anko. Anko, please get up. Don't tell me you've got nothing else. Is this the woman I adopted as my own sister, the woman I swore to protect with my sword? Or are you simply an Orochimaru stooge? Anko growled in response to the insult, struggling to get up, but her body refused to cooperate. I'm trying, believe me. I'm trying, but you're making it difficult. It was never supposed to be easy, Anko. Don't you say that all the time? Or are you just a liar? After all, you do take after a snake like Orochimaru despite your purported hatred. Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Anko raged, her rage almost overpowering her conscious mind, which she was doing everything she could to avoid. You see, Anko, that's your issue. You're up against it. You're going against your instincts. Anko, we're predators. We are warriors. You will be weak as long as you ignore your instincts. If you want to silence me, get off your ass and make me. Anko's chakra flared as she slowly stood up. Didn't I tell you to stop talking? I'm going to kill you, fucking brat. Anko resumed her previous position, oblivious to the changes taking place within her body, changes that Kiyubi did notice. Her eyes slitted like a cat's, allowing her to see better, and her bones relaxed and shifted. She no longer had the large, long bones of a human. Instead, her bones resembled the body of a snake, including her arms and legs. Muscles covered the new skeletal structure, increasing strength. Kiyubi laughed as he spoke with Anko. Now let's see how the brat treats you, Chibi Hubby Chan. Go get them. Anko charged at Naruto with a grunt, her new limbs striking out much faster than before, with whip-like clawing motions that drew blood with her newly sharpened nails or precision jabs that could break bones and dislocate arms. Naruto smirked, falling on the defensive, leading Anko on even further. It was exactly what she needed to improve. Naruto evaded most attacks by blocking, parrying, and weaving, leaving only a few claw marks on his arms from Anko's lashing nails. Of course, the fact that his skin could easily stop a kanai meant she either channeled Futen Chakra or, more likely, activated a shortened version of his own claw ability. Naruto then lashed out with a kick, taking Anko's breath away from the strike to her sternum. Anko flew back before riding herself in midair and using the wall as a springboard to lash out like a cobra at Naruto, a strike that would have ripped his throat out if Naruto hadn't used his superior eyesight. Even so, Naruto narrowly avoided the worst, only having his eyebrow literally ripped off. Before bringing out the big guns, Naruto cursed. He quickly formed his claws, fighting Anko once more, pushing her to the wall and forcing her to evolve. Anko's sharpened nails grew bigger and bigger, until they were only slightly shorter than Naruto's. What they lacked in size, they made up for in incredible speed and sharpness, which Kiyubi was quick to warn his original host about. Before disengaging and jumping back, Naruto received a slash on his forearm. 
Slowly bringing it to his lips, he licked the blood away. Naruto glared at Anko, the taste of his own blood on his lips, promising one of two things. Either a quick death that you wouldn't notice until the Shinigami bagged you up, or a slow and painful death that you'd beg the Shinigami to come and bag you up. Naruto's features changed to a more animalistic configuration with a feral roar, his eyes becoming bloodshot and slitted, muscles bulging, nose flaring open, ears sharpening, and skin becoming more rigid. Naruto was in combat mode in seconds and charged Anko. Shouts, screams, and yells drew everyone's attention outside the steel and granite reinforced dojo. Jiraiya stopped Tenten from opening the door, concerned for her teammates' safety. It is now their battle. If you interfere, they'll gang up on you. Let them figure it out. If that kid has half Kyuubi's tenacity, he won't die even if he's put through a meat grinder. Let's let them work it out like siblings. I'm guessing this is just a friendly match, nothing to be concerned about. Senin, the elderly man, spoke up. Of course, if he had been watching the fight, he might have sung something different. Naruto and Anko's little scuffle took hours to resolve. By the time they got out, they were both covered head to toe in blood and fading scratches, had about 75% of their clothes ripped to shreds, were exhausted, and sported identical huge grins. Hinata sighed when she saw them and went to get them a new outfit. While the food was being prepared, Anko took the opportunity to flaunt her new, kick-ass claws. Naruto laughed at her claims that they cut the meat better than any knife she had ever seen. The week progressed slowly, with most people increasing their physical and chakra workouts, and Anko and Naruto engaging in intense, all-out fighting. By the end of the week, Anko had acquired her heat sight, which she displayed incredible talent in, as well as poisonous fangs and her own version of Naruto's armor ability. Anko's armor was more reminiscent of a snake's scaly skin than Naruto's, which was mostly large plates interlocking with each other. Kiyubi hypothesized that the powers adapted to the owner's thinking. Naruto was a force to be reckoned with, relying on his strength first and his speed second. As a result, his version was designed to allow him to withstand massive punishment and tire out the enemy before disengaging and quickly dispatching the tired enemy. However, in Anko's case, a lack of speed and finesse would be disastrous, so Anko's skin evolved to provide as much protection as possible while maintaining maximum maneuverability. Naruto eventually granted the three new members access to the armory as the team progressed. Tenten squealed with delight before entering, while Kiba smirked. Lee politely refused, but Naruto dragged him along anyway. Once inside, they noticed that the walls were lined with various weapons, ranging from the more common, such as Wakazashi and Tonto, to the more exotic, such as polearms and even a Tetsubo, a metallic staff with a thick spiky, business end. Tenten was about to leap at them when Naruto stopped her. Tenten, I know you adore them, but please exercise some restraint. Aside from that, there are the, basic, weapons. While they are all of high quality, they are all average in every other way. Come with me to my personal stash. With these words, Naruto led them to the next room of the armory, one of the few that the new members had not yet visited. It was the largest room in the house. It had a library covering one wall and a desk in the corner. There were several scrolls and books with calligraphy supplies on the desk. A few weapons were hung on the walls, and a samurai-style armor was displayed on an armor stand. Naruto took advantage of the opportunity to educate them. While I am not as good a seal master as the Yandaimi was, I am good enough to be able to improve some weapons. I've got some of my failed and successful experiments in here. A few of these experiments are dangerous in the wrong hands, which is why I won't let you in. It has the potential to be lethal for you, which I obviously do not want. Wait a second please. Could you come over here, Haku? As Haku approached Naruto, he took a katana from the wall stand. Its sheath and hilt wrapping were both a gentle light blue color. The Suba, guard, was a snowflake-shaped silver star. He presented it to Haku in slow, almost reverent motions. 
This is possibly the most difficult weapon I've ever had the pleasure of creating. I finished my freezing array and applied it to this sword in two different places. Here are the technical specifications for this work of art. This blade, like all of my works, will not rust or blunt. It is made of chakra conductive material, making it simple to use futon. I've also added an advanced storage seal to the blade, which is already filled with water and ready to use with your techniques. The freezing array can force you to use a hyaton almost immediately or give your opponent frostbites. Another seal can be found on the blade's butte. This one conceals a chain with a crescent blade at its tip. While it is sharp, it is best used to wrap an enemy in it and freeze them via the array on it. You can also control the length of the chain using my advanced storage seal. All that remains is to lock your chakra so that no one else can use it and to give it a name. Haku and Zabuza were taken aback. This weapon was a work of art. Tenten was almost ecstatic at the prospect of receiving such a weapon. After all, if he can do all of that with a sword, there will be no limits. Sharp and pointy weapons please. Not to mention that he mentioned an advanced storage seal. Tenten almost fainted at the possibilities Naruto was hinting at. Lee was astounded as well. Who knew seals could wield such power? Shino, on the other hand, was overjoyed. With such a potent weapon, Haku's safety was all but guaranteed. Kuranai was envious of the weapon and wished she could get something as good as it, whereas Hinata was far more envious. After all, she was Naruto's girlfriend, and Naruto was supposed to get her the best weapons. In retaliation, she'd make sure to save him a good pout. Anko laughed, Haku was always good for speed practice, and with this blade at her side, she'd be even better. Naruto took the lead once more. Now I'd like you to look around and let me know if you see anything that piques your interest. If not, give me an idea and I'll make you a weapon, okay? Oh, and don't even think about touching the black sheathed sword. Understood? Lee, Kiba, and Tenten nodded before proceeding to examine all of these weapons. Tenten, on the other hand, seemed to be dragging the others along with her. Meanwhile, Zabuza, Haku, Anko, and Team 8 gathered around Naruto to brainstorm new ways to improve their weapons. Anko had the brilliant idea of making a weapon thinner while keeping the same mass. Paper-thin weapons with the original's mass? In the case of people like Zabuza, it's an instant bloodbath. Meanwhile, Tenten split up with the boys, hopping from sword to sword like a sugar-crazed child. She eventually rose to a black sheathed sword, lying apart from the others. As far as she could tell, it was beautifully crafted. She weighted it slowly and tentatively, finding it to be perfectly balanced. So, why did Naruto warn them to stay away from such an expertly crafted sword? He's just being dramatic. There's nothing wrong with this beauty. Tenten had a thought. She unsheathed the blade slowly. It was a stunning, gleaming black blade. A small red dragon, almost burning with power, was engraved on the blade's base. Tenten's gaze was drawn to the black wrapped hilt, which she grasped. She then turned to look at Naruto. What's the matter with this blade, Whiskers? It's ideal. Everyone saw Naruto's eyes widen in fear before he screamed. Ten. No. He didn't make it to Tenten before she was swallowed up by a black and red chakra so powerful that it could be seen with the naked eye. Tenten screamed in pain as the burst of energy knocked everyone back. Tenten collapsed in a boneless heap after the flaring power stopped for a few seconds. Naruto desperately tried to untangle her fingers from the hilt of the blade, but it was impossible. Hanada and the others rushed to his side, all concerned for Tenten's fate. Damn it I told you not to touch it, Tenten, and now there's nothing I can do. The sword has the potential to kill or consume her. Damn it. Could you take her to her room and give her some medical attention, Hinaheim? I consulted a demon lord and a pervert. Anko, follow her. If worst comes to worst, kill Tenten. 
If you have to, you'll know. Hanada initially nodded to Naruto's request, but then looked horrified at his request to kill Tenten. Lee, on the other hand, beat her to the punch as to why she had to kill Tenten. Because Lee. This isn't just any ordinary blade. It was forged with Kiyubi's yukai and blood. A blade so dangerous that not even I dare to touch it. The blade, while created after my fight with Kiyubi and thus not evil, has attained a level of semi-intelligence. It will naturally want to cut things because it is a blade. When you combine that with Kiyubi's natural thirst for blood, you have a very dangerous blade. If Tenten is unable to control the blade's desires, it will either overload her body with Yukai and kill her, or it will consume her mind and soul, turning her into a soulless murderer. Lee and the others had just realized how much Naruto was hurting by admitting it. Anko understood why Naruto asked her to keep an eye on Tenten, because she was the only one who could fight a demonically possessed blade overrun by Yukai. Anko couldn't even begin to comprehend the weight Naruto placed on her shoulders by entrusting Hanada to her. Anko knew Naruto would want nothing more than to be there and do it alone, but he needed to consult the only two beings he could about the possibilities and potential solutions to this messed up situation. Anko quickly nodded and picked up Tenten before heading to the sleeping quarters with Hanada. Naruto motioned to Jiraiya who had managed to copy a few of Naruto's own seals onto his notebook, to take a seat. After that, he simply pushed the rest of the people out of the room before forming a cage bunshin whose sole purpose would be to vocalize Kiyubi's suggestions so Naruto wouldn't have to speak twice. The two seal users and the demon lord imbued clone quickly began discussing possible actions. They had come up with nothing after a few hours, not even a definite way to subdue the blade or free Tenten from its grasp if she lost. A soft knock caught their attention. Naruto went to open it, seeing a terrified Hanada behind him. Fearing the worst, Naruto grabbed her by the shoulders and asked her if Tenten went on a killing spree or died. Hanada barely managed a negative response to the barrage of questions. She responded to Naruto's subsequent question about what happened with something that shocked him. I checked Tenten San with my Byakugan to make sure I hadn't missed an internal wound. Tenten San, on the other hand. She's developing a secondary chakra system. Jiraiya, Naruto, and even the Kiyubi possessed clone all exclaimed loudly. Hanada, on the other hand, kept up by reporting what she discovered. This secondary chakra system is similar to yours, Naruto-kun, but smaller and weaker. It's also intertwined with her regular one, like two linked vials that are also separate. Her normal chakra bleeds out into this new chakra coil, but the opposite is not true. Once there, it becomes similar to Kiyubi's. Not nearly as potent or thick, but it's red and black in color and much more. Viscous is probably the best way to describe it. Furthermore, the majority of this new chakra, I suppose, is channeled into the blade and somehow absorbed. What's going on with Tenten San, Naruto kun, Jiraiya sama, Kiyubi san? It was one of the few times Naruto had been astounded, and even fewer times when neither of his companions could provide an adequate response. Naruto couldn't help but be curious. What kind of power has he bestowed upon the world? What sort of curse did he inflict on Tenten? Needless to say, the group of four people was now attempting to solve the mystery of Tenten's sword. Meanwhile, outside, Zabuza was looking at the two genin under his watch with almost no mercy. He decided that whatever was wrong with Tenten shouldn't stop the others from improving. Instead, it should be used to motivate them to improve their skills. Alright, brats. Because the bun girl is gone, you three will have to work twice as hard to fill her shoes. Got it? Now Wonder Brat has told me what he wants you three to learn. He said, those fangs over there, pointing to Kiba, and the little furball, pointing to Akamaru, should work on their speed. You two are excellent combo users who are also quite strong. You simply need more speed, a suitable weapon, and some ninjutsu. Go to the side, 
huddle up, and decide on your specialties. You're obviously a taijutsu and scout expert, but you might also be good at assassination. Now get. Now, back to your case. With raised eyebrows, Naruto advised that since you couldn't use chakra, you should focus on other things. Meditation, traditional shinobi tactics, strategy, and, of course, taijutsu and your weapon of choice. You're pretty good at taijutsu, and I can't teach you any more, but your weapon. I can help with. Also, the Gaki mentioned something about you using physical and spiritual energy separately, but I have no idea how you're going to do it. So, until the Wonder Brad arrives, we'll work on things to help you get by. Zabuza continued, allowing Lee to absorb the information. I may be a Zanbatu specialist, but that doesn't mean I don't know how to use other weapons. So, we'll go back in, find you a proper weapon to wield, and then head back out for training. One word of caution, Gaki. If you thought my training you the previous week was bad, wait until you see what I'm about to do to you now. I'm going to make you beg me to stop, work you to unconsciousness, and then some. So go choose your weapon and get ready, because there's no turning back now. Now, buckle up and let's go. We're destroying daylight. When Lee and Zabuza returned, they went into the armory to look for a weapon suitable for Lee. Lee, for one, refused to use a weapon because it would dampen his flames of youth, as he repeatedly yelled at Zabuza. Of course, it's difficult to say no to Zabuza when he's pissed as hell. Once inside the armory, Zabuza began selecting weapons for Lee to try. He progressed from the small and quick Tonto to the more adaptable Wakazashi, Katana, Chukuto, and even O Katana. Nothing suited the Genin in green. After being disappointed, he moved on to Zanbatu and Spears, where he discovered that the kid had better instincts for wielding. Zabuza discovered the best weapon for Lee's instincts after much, and I mean much, trial and error. It was a magnificent polearm, with a steel pole that was more than 2 meters, 6 feet 6 inches feet, long in total. The blade was curved and thick, designed to slash through arms and armor alike, and the bottom featured a steel orb with two-inch long spikes. While unadorned, Lee and Zabuza both understood that this weapon was designed for use and abuse. Of course, Lee asked Zabuza why that weapon suited him best, not so calmly, but you get the idea. Because Gaki, you're one of the few people at your age who can actually lift this, which is important because you need to get used to it. It also fits your fighting style. While most people would assume it is slow because it is heavy, I can easily see it moving very quickly in the right hands. Aside from that, you actually have talent in using this, and it will temper you. Temper me? Zabuza Sensei? The fires of youth should not be quenched. Yosh. Zabuza sighed in reply before responding. That is why you aren't as strong as you could be. While your flames of youth are beneficial for training, you must also learn to control them. Otherwise, you will become a danger not only to yourself, but also to your friends. This weapon necessitates a high level of concentration and control. You're anything but focused and in control right now. Your emotions have complete control over you, just like any other animal. Instincts are useful. You need them. But you must also control yourself and your actions. Think before acting. I'm going to take you away from the flames of youth and show you the water of calm. Take up your sword and follow me. I'm not sure I can teach you even the fundamentals because you have so much to learn. Move now. Lee jumped up and moved, shouting about how powerful the flames of youth burned and how his burning passion would overcome all obstacles. Zabuza, for one, wanted to facepalm, but that would take time, which he didn't have. Meanwhile, Kiba and Akamaru were discussing their options. What did they excel at? What were their skills? What is their potential? Finally, what did they want to do with the rest of their lives? Kiba had always wanted to be an oi-nin like his father, the man whose stories had raised him. Kiba had been training himself for outdoor survival, scouting, and, of course, perseverance since he was a child. 
It only made his mother and sister laugh. They laughed because they didn't believe in him, the idiot he could be at times. But it didn't deter him. In fact, it made him even more determined to achieve his goals. Now that he'd spent some time near an Oinin, a person who didn't shy away from words and truth, he knew how difficult it was, and how dangerous it could be. Did Kiba really want to be an Oinin, someone who spent most of his time on top of a tree looking for a mark? Never coming home, not having a home like the majority of people. Would he be able to live like that? Haku had detailed how difficult and demanding her job as an Oinin was. How hard she had to work in order to get the mark. How difficult it was to train or prepare for a fight. Kiba sighed, it had been a difficult decision. On the one hand, his childhood fantasy of hunting bad guys with his trusty Nin Ken. On the other hand, there are the hazards, risks, and demands of the job. Kiba, contrary to popular belief, was not a moron. He wasn't as bright as Shikamaru, but he wasn't a complete moron either. He simply had a short attention span when it came to things that didn't interest him, such as theory and tactics. That didn't mean he couldn't think when the situation demanded it. So Kiba contemplated the possibilities, the gains and losses for a long time. Akamaru also aided him in his decision. In the end, it was remembering why Naruto had summoned them that convinced him. Everyone else had their specialties. He'd come up with his own. He'd be the hunter, stalking his prey, which would be any threat to his friends and packmates. He'd go after them ruthlessly and efficiently. Give no quarter, and don't expect one. He'd be an assassin, a shadow walker, taming the beast within. All in order to protect his packmates. Not his packmates. Those who went above and beyond. Tomodachi's Tomodachi, close friends in Japanese, like best buddies. Kiba took a page from Lee's book when making his decision. He hid in the trees outside the HQ exit, smirking wildly at his dog partner. He'd be well on his way to becoming an effective hunter if he could surprise Zabuza, Haku, or Shino, all of whom were admittedly extremely alert. If not, practice makes perfect. Kiba was warned by Lee's shouts of youth and whatnot that his prey was approaching. As a large shadow emerged from the cave, the hunter tensed. Tenton was in pain. She'd been in pain a few times before, nearly all of them as a result of a fight with Neji. Damn bastard may have been her childhood crush, but after he seriously injured her in a spar, she had very few feelings for him. Especially since it was always fate that declared it. When Tenton opened her eyes, her train of thought came to a halt. She had no idea what that place was. It wasn't above ground, for sure. She was in a subterranean dome. It wasn't a dome, she realized, but a massive sphere. She was inside a massive sphere, so large that her eyes couldn't see the top, but she knew it was there. There were weapons all around her. Weapons of every shape, size, and type. Weapons she'd never seen before. From heavy, double-edged, straight monstrosities, Zweihander, to short, elegant curved daggers. Tenton realized there was no one around her and no way out. She, of course, reacted. Where in the world am I? Tenton heard her voice reverberate on invisible walls, distorted and louder, making her scream from the pain in her eardrums. All things considered, she didn't expect to hear a voice respond to her. Of course, you're here. It had an arrogant, deep baritone voice and even more arrogant speech. Tenton turned around to face the voice and saw a giant of a man. Dressed in all black with red decorations armor, resembling a samurai but much, much more decorated, as if it belonged to the emperor himself. His posture exuded arrogance, superiority, and suppressed bloodlust. The decorations on the man's armor were dominated by a blood-red dragon. The second most prominent figure was a black fox with nine tails, its fearsome visage seemingly battling the dragon, while also made out of the dragon's unpainted armor, it is in short an optical illusion, 
like a drawing of red lines that roughly form the outline of a black fox. Only the lines are actually dragons. Hope that helps picture it better. A sword was sheathed on the man's left side. The grip was covered in black leather, and it was sheathed in a pitch black sheath. The person continued in the same arrogant tone. You are my proprietor. While phrased as a question, it was also a declaration, Kasama ga waga mochinushi, in Japanese. What the hell are you on about? Who are you, and where am I? Tenten was still bothered by the presence and her location. As I previously stated, you are my boss. I'm Muramasa, and you've arrived. You appear to be too stupid to be my wielder, little girl. Tenten could see the man's arrogance, but his answers irritated her more than his answers. I did hear it the first time. You didn't, however, explain anything. What the fuck is going on here, and what the fuck do you mean by owner? HMPH, such crude language, not even aware of the meanings of the words you spout. So, I will give you a break. Because you were the first to pick me up, you are my potential master. But, from what I can tell, you're too stupid and frail to wield me. The answer to where we are is straightforward. Within your rather limited mind. Get up, little girl. It's time to put you to the test. With these words, the person now known as Muramasa drew his sword slowly. Tenten gaped at the sword. It was the same black sword she held before fainting. I see you're starting to grasp a few concepts, little girl. Good, there is still hope for someone as frail as you. Tenten was getting irritated by this point. Underestimating her for her gender and age was one of the few things that pushed her over the edge. She was a serious, dedicated, and capable kunoichi, damn it. Nobody ever undervalued her. Shut up, you jerk. Little girl, is not my name. Tenten, damn it. Study it. At least you don't flee at the first sight of me. Good. Get up, little girl, and give me a reason to address you by name. Unless you are undeserving of even that basic courtesy. Tenten did get up at that point. She immediately grabbed a sword from nearby and charged Muramasa. Muramasa appeared uninterested as he casually blocked her attacks as if they were mosquito bites, moving at the speed of a half-asleep turtle. HMPH, is that all? You're holding back despite your zeal. You cannot defeat me in this manner. Is it because, despite my insults, you have no reason to fight me? Is that all? Tenten was forced to pause by Muramasa's words, at which point she realized two things. First, he was correct, and second, she was not tired. Swinging a sword wildly causes fatigue no matter how little one fights. Tenten's arms, however, were empty. As if she had just awoken from a deep slumber. It was then that she considered Muramasa's words about this place being her mind. She rose slowly from the tumble Muramasa had sent her into. Let me clarify something. This is Muramasa, and you are inside my head. You speak as if you were an object, arrogant as hell, but an object. The only thing I can think of to compare you to. Tenten's eyes widened as he considered the implications of the new discovery. The sword, Naruto warned us not to touch. Muramasa gave a barely visible nod, much to Tenten's surprise. You are correct. My name is Muramasa, and I am the Black Sword. Tenten filed that away. She'd think about it when no one was chopping her to pieces for no apparent reason. Alright, now that we've settled it. Why must I fight you? Simple. Superiority. Muramasa continued in response to Tenten's incoming question. Why does a man ride a horse instead of the other way around? It's because humans outnumber horses. What distinguishes it from wielding a sword? Do you command the sword, or does it command you? Are you superior to your own sword, or vice versa? What matters in the end? The sword or the sword wielder. I refuse to be controlled by someone weaker than myself because of who I am. 
I will not serve a weak master. As a result, I'll put you to the test. You and I are going to fight. If you win, I will submit and serve as your loyal weapon for as long as you maintain your superiority over me. If I win, you will simply submit to me and become my tool. I will use your body to fulfill my calling and the purpose for which I was created. Specifically, killing. Tenton was both terrified and creeped out by the sword's declarations. Worse, it made sense. Worse, she was aware that it was true. She would have to defeat the sword or become its slave. No worse, she reasoned. It would be even worse. The sword would drive her insane and lead to her murder. Her friends were murdered. Lee, Hanada, Kiba, Naruto, Haku, Shino, Kurenai, and even Zabuza and Anko. Tenten prepared herself for another round of fighting, her determination finally visible in her eyes. The representation of the sword then stunned her once more. You now understand why. Good. You have two of the three pieces of the puzzle that will allow you to defeat me. You have the will to fight, and you have a reason to fight. But. You will never be able to defeat me. Why? Because, even though the battle has not yet been decided, I am a part of you. I recognize you. I am aware of your desires, fantasies, nightmares, and fears. I'm familiar with your fighting style, moves, and everything else. You can't hide from me, you can't fool me, and you can't outwit me. To defeat me, you must solve one more part of the riddle. One more response. Can you find the solution? Or will you cave? Tenton paused. She had a feeling Muramasa wouldn't attack her until she was ready. He was, however, vexing. Sure, he made sense, but did he have to be so arrogant and irritating about it? Tenton shook her head, clearing her mind of the sword that had an ego the size of Iwa. Tenton took her time clearing her mind. Thinking about everything, every word, every movement, and every hidden meaning of Muramasa's words. What he said, what he meant, how he said it, what meanings could be hidden, and what was the riddle she had to solve. Even though the fight has not yet been decided, I am a part of you. I recognize you. I refuse to be ruled by someone less powerful than myself. I will not serve a weak master. That was the response. It was so simple. Muramasa did not want a clumsy wielder. He was a haughty sword. It would be unacceptable to have a weakling as a master. For someone so proud, the thought of a wielder completely dependent on Muramasa's power alone must be unbearable. She realized her pride wasn't entirely undeserved. Muramasa was an excellent blade and a formidable partner. Tenten smiled, knowing exactly what Muramasa meant. She had to improve because he knew who she was. She needed to show Muramasa that she wasn't weak, that she wasn't dependent, that she wasn't foolish, and that she didn't lack pride. Tenten may already be standing, but she could just as easily be sitting. She straightened up, her muscles relaxed but ready, her posture calm, collected, and in control, having found the answer to Muramasa's question. She took a look at the sword in her hand and withdrew it. As she extended her arm to the side, a blade fell into her hand, feeling natural, as if it had always belonged there. It was a long black katana with a red dragon inscription on the blade and black hilt wraps. Tenton leveled her gaze at her opponent, her blade poised, her eyes confident, and her posture firm. I recognize Muramasa now. I apologize for doubting you and your pride. Sorry for not noticing it sooner. You were watching out for me, weren't you? You want me to wield you, but you want me to be proud of it. To be equal and deserving of your position of power. I understand now, and I want you to know that regardless of who wins, I am honored to have held you in my hand, honored to be able to fight you. But, above all, I am proud. I am honored that you thought I had the potential to wield you. And it wouldn't be any other way for me. Tenten's blade rose slowly in front of her, both hands gripped. 
Muramasa imitated this posture. Their movements were identical, as if they were looking in a mirror. Both warriors seemed to exude power, a reflection of their own strength. Tenten prepared her blade and charged, Muramasa mimicking her movement. Both collided in the center, neither giving an inch. The fight continued, with both parties performing the same movements at the same time, with the same force behind their attacks. Both jumped back. Both drew their swords to the side. Both charged again, intent on delivering the fatal blow. One of the swords flared in power, surrounded by a red and black aura. A cry rang out across the sphere, followed by a flash of light, and both warriors were back to back. One of them knelt down and disintegrated. The other raised the sword in silent salute to the one who had been defeated. The winner's voice was barely audible, but it was full of pride. This is my first attack in honor of you. Onigiri, demon cut, a worthy attack for you, my partner and ally. And this is only the beginning. I will become even more powerful, and I will not stop growing stronger. Muramasa, I will validate your pride. Now let us go show the rest of the world what we're made of. The final figure let the sword fall to the side and vanished. A tall, giant of a man dressed in black and red samurai armor smiled deep within the sphere. He'd made a wise decision. She'd make an excellent master. With a start, Tenten awoke. She opened her eyes slowly, taking in her surroundings. She was in her headquarters room. She then realized she was almost naked but wrapped in a warm blanket. Turning her head to the side, she noticed Lee sitting on a chair next to her bed, with a bowl of water and, according to what she smelled, herbs on his lap. Tenten quickly corrected herself, stating that Lee was sleeping. When she tried to raise herself, she felt a weight on her right hand and realized it was Muramasa, the black sword. It appeared to be. Soothing? No, it looks like it's always been there. She felt a tug in her mind almost immediately, a strong desire to kill. Tenten raised her sword over Lee almost unconsciously before restraining herself. She let go of the sword while consciously lowering her arm. She wrapped the blanket around her to preserve her dignity and gently shook Lee awake, choosing to think about it later. Before realizing who shook him away, the sleepy boy muttered something about water, fire, and guy. Tenten San. You've woken up. Yosh. You've overcome the power of that unyouthful sword. Your youthful flames are as bright as ever. Lee exclaimed joyfully. Tenten had half a mind to follow Muramasa's command and sever Lee's head. She had only just awoken. After forcing herself to calm down and making a mental note to speak to Naruto about the sword, she slugged Lee in the head, sending him sprawling on the ground. Lee, please. I just woke up. Why can't you speak calmly for a change? Now get up and leave. I need to dress, and if I ever discover you were the one who took my clothes off, I'll kill you. Got it? Lee felt compelled to weep at Tenten's enraged expression before scrambling up. Yosh. I'll go tell Hanada Chan you've recovered. She was the first to look after you, and then the rest of us took turns. If I can't tell her in under 20 seconds, oh. Wham. Tenten slugged Lee once more, signaling that it was time to move on. Lee scurried out of the room, screaming about flames of youth. Tenten hurriedly put on his clothes. She sheathed the demonic blade and strapped it to her waist, using Muramasa's sheath that had been placed next to her bed by someone, most likely Naruto. Hanada and Haku were the first to arrive, almost tossing Tenten back to bed to examine her wounds and chakra coils. Tenten had barely enough time to avoid the two charging, overzealous and concerned medics. Of course, they wouldn't give up so easily, quickly forcing Tenten onto the bed to check her, despite Tenten's protests that she was fine. I'm fine, believe me. Will you please let me go? Come on, I'm perfect. Tenten's cries were silenced when she saw Hanada's expression. 
something had made her nervous. Hinata spoke in a calm, cool, and commanding tone. No, you do not. Now shut up, relax, and let us do our work. Don't even try to get out because you have no idea what happened to you while you were unconscious. Tenten gulped at the seriousness of Hinata's voice. Tenten calmed down and let them examine her rather than infuriating her further. After what seemed like an hour, Hinata and Haku gave the okay for the weapon master to get up. Hinata sent Haku to get Naruto because he would be needed for what was about to happen. Meanwhile, Hinata was attempting to prepare Tenten for what had occurred. Do you even realize what happened, Tenten-san? Do you realize you almost died, or worse, that you turned into a soulless killing machine? Um, Muramasa kind of explained it to me. Tenten continued after Hinata's obvious question. The sword's name is Muramasa. I had to compete with him for superiority. Hinata groaned. Tenten, that sword is unique, forged in the blood of a demon, and not just any demon, but the Kiyubi no Yoko. Do you get what I'm saying? Your body may be fine in your eyes, but it isn't in mine. Such weapons. Alter people. It has altered you. You're more aggressive now, more easily irritated. But that's just the obvious. You were changed on more than just an emotional level. You. At that moment, the door opened to reveal Naruto in his training clothes. He approached Tenten, and she could tell he was on the verge of kicking her behind right then and there. Do you have any idea what you did, Tenten? What were you thinking when you grabbed the sword? Didn't I warn you not to touch it? Tenten was upset with Naruto for yelling at her, not realizing her hand had moved closer to Muramasa. So, fucking what? You left Muramasa in plain fucking view. If you don't want us to get these weapons, don't leave them out in the open. Better yet don't make them at all you fucking idiot. Slap. Tenten staggered back from Naruto's slap, stunned out of her rage. Listen to yourself Tenten. You're yelling at me for something you did wrong. Do you realize how concerned we were all? Do you know how I felt when I told Anko, yes, told her, to kill you if you became a thrall to your weapon? Do you know what the ramifications of this sword being unsheathed will be? Tell me, Tenten, do you have any idea what you just did? The girl was taken aback by Naruto's words before realizing he was correct about her. She mumbled an apology before asking what had happened. Naruto rubbed his temples to relax before turning to face Hanada. Haim, please explain to Tenten what happened before I explain her punishment and new responsibilities. Hanada nodded before taking a close look at Tenten. Your body was unaccustomed to the yukai that the sword emits when you picked it up. In order for you to be compatible with the sword, it forced your body to create a secondary chakra coil system, wrapping around and communicating with your original one. Your chakra enters this secondary system, condensing and transforming into yukai, demonic energy. Tenten exclaimed, her eyes widening as she realized how serious things were. Yukai, on the other hand, does not revert to chakra to fill your coils, which almost killed you due to chakra exhaustion. The Yukai itself flowed into Muramasa's sword, where it was absorbed. You. You look more like a Jinchuriki than a human now. Fortunately, the Yukai within you is much weaker than any Bijus, so it does not poison you or others. Its color is a mix of red and black, as opposed to the usual blue. Before taking the lead, Naruto nodded along with Hanada. Muramasa was created from my own blood, which, as you may recall, contained Kiyubi. The combination of Yukai, demon blood, and the calling of a sword to cut things could easily destroy your mind, turning you into a soulless killer. But the issues do not end there. Muramasa is a very powerful sword. If word gets out, you'll have people after your head and your sword in no time. While you do have an advantage, they may go after others to get to you. You'll have issues even in Konoha. For example, that damn Uchiha may believe he deserves the sword and attempt to take it from you. 
You can deal with him, but he will complain to the council about needing that weapon. Try defending yourself against these Cretans. Do you want me to continue? If they discover you can use Yukai, even if it is diluted, they will force you to have sex with any male clan heir they can find in the hopes of replicating it. They may try to force artificial insemination in the hopes of increasing the power of another Keke Jenke. Not to mention a certain warhawk who may try to kidnap you by staging your death, brainwash you, and have you and your children serve as loyal puppets for him. It will also attract other unscrupulous people, such as Orochimaru. Not to mention that many civilians will despise you as a result of my demon magics. Do you want more? It will draw attention to me in order for me to make more swords like that for them. Do you realize how much attention you brought our way? The wrong kind of focus. Naruto exhaled deeply and sighed. You are no longer permitted to use Muramasa in front of onlookers. Even so, only the most dire circumstances would warrant drawing Muramasa. Meanwhile, I must train you personally in order for you to learn how to channel Yukai safely as well as control the sword's urges. Tenten, you've pretty much messed up the whole thing now. As additional punishment, you have demonstrated that you are not prepared for a specialized weapon from me. You must first master Muramasa and demonstrate to us all that you have complete command. Only then will I create a weapon for you. You won't really need it. I can feel Muramasa's power even now, and knowing Q, that's not even a tenth of its true power. Be glad Jiraiya arrived to begin preparing a room containing Yukai. Otherwise, I'd have to keep you here, unable to use any Yukai because half of Konoha would discover us. Tenten was taken aback. What in the world had she done? She'd just drawn a sword and she messed up spectacularly. She collapsed on her bed, reeling from the information she had just received. Now she understands that when Naruto says something, it is in your best interest to listen. Tenten ducked her head and did the only thing she could, accept her fate and failure. Naruto looked down at the defeated Kunoichi. Good, it appears you understand the scope of the situation. We can move forward now that you understand the consequences of your actions. Despite how irate I sounded, I was more concerned than anything else. Whether you like it or not, you, like everyone else in this plan, are my responsibility. Also, despite my refusal to allow you to use Muramasa, you will be forced to learn how to use it at some point. I need to talk to the old man and Aero Senin about what we can do to keep it under control, or at least out of the hands of the council. But with Gigi being so old, it'll be difficult unless we can find a replacement. Sigh asterisk, get some rest now, because your chakra is almost empty, despite how good you feel. Make another attempt to contact Muramasa, but this time do not draw the blade. You're acting more aggressively than usual, and we don't need any more messes today, what with Lee and Zabuza. Mumble about zealots wielding oversized weapons asterisk, anyway, go back to sleep now. We begin training early in the morning. Naruto walked out of the room, his shoulders slumped, looking much older than he was. Hanada stayed a little longer to console Tenten about her blunder, knowing she needed it. As Naruto approached, Zabuza, Kiba, Haku, Shino, and Lee all looked up. Shino was the first person to speak up. Naruto, how is Tenten? Aside from physical condition. Not to mention that you appear distressed. Please share your burden with us. Naruto sat down and got a bottle of juice to calm down before telling everyone the news. It elicited several worried looks and curses. Even Lee didn't shout about youth, instead focusing on his teammates' future. When Hinata returned to the group, she placed her head on Naruto's lap and his hand on her hair, letting him know she was in the same boat as him and needed someone to comfort her. Anko and Kuranai, who had gone out to get food and weapons, later replaced the group. Anko came across a scene that was prime, with a capital P, blackmail material. Naruto sat on Hanada's lap, his arms wrapped around her, his face nuzzling her stomach, and he made a sound, 
sounding more like an overfed, overgrown, and overpetted cat than the war machine he usually was. Naruto actually purred when Hanada began petting his head. Naruto obviously allowed himself to be in that state because everyone else had left for their own training. Kuranai screamed, Kawaii, waking the two lovebirds from their tender moment, and Anko had barely enough time to snap a photo of them. An event that made Hanada and, surprisingly, Naruto cry. A second flash of light guaranteed Anko even more blackmail. Meanwhile, Zabuza was instructing Lee on how to properly use his weapon, which had been renamed a Quan Dao, or Quan Dao or Quan Dao, it's the same really, just different ways to write it. Lee could attack with both the bladed and spiked ball ends of the weapon, and the weight of the weapon ensured that the blows were devastating. The fighting style Zabuza was teaching to Lee was an adaptation of his own Zanbatu fighting style named, Flowing River. The principle was rotating in the same direction. The weight of the weapons made sure that the speed increased, as well as making it much, much harder to defend as the enemy's arms would grow numb within seconds from the violent attacks. The practitioner was later able to quickly reverse the attack without losing any momentum or speed, making it an insanely effective style, thanks to advanced physics learned through practice rather than theory. The enemy was essentially reduced to three options. Dodging the blow, which had the unfortunate side effect of the weapon increasing in speed, making it progressively harder to dodge, blocking the blow, which could shatter bones depending on the momentum of the attack, or taking the hit, which was even worse for obvious reasons. The style also used twirling of the weapon very close to the body in order to both defend as well as gather momentum before an attack. Lee was working hard on the style and Zabuza had to hand it to the kid, he was one serious hard worker. Lee would continuously perform the weapon forms adapted for use with his polearm from before dawn to after dark. The adaptation was mostly adjusting for the counterweight of the spiked ball as well as integrating it in attacks. The only problem? Lee's strength was so great that the weapon was showing signs of abuse from just two days of training. The strain on the steel was too much, and it was beginning to break. Zabuza chuckled inside, Konoha must be full of retards if they couldn't see how badass the kid could become given a fair chance, a fair weapon, and a fair sensei. Now that he'd gotten something above average in all three areas. He'd show them what it meant to be a prodigy. Zabuza was surprised to learn how much weight Lee carried, only to be shocked to learn that Lee was disappointed because he had run out of space for weights and couldn't train himself any further. Obviously, Zabuza had already assigned Naruto to make a few items for Lee. The first was a set of heavier weights that would affect the entire body rather than just the legs. The second item was a brand new weapon for Lee to use, one that would be able to withstand the abuse this time. Zabuza was quietly watching Lee perform the katas when Lee surprised him. Lee hit the ground so hard that he actually made a deep crater followed by a shockwave on a move that required a jump followed by a downward slash from the weapon as a sort of defense-breaking move, think Dante's Helmbreaker attack to get an idea of what I mean. The much-abused weapon then broke in Lee's hands. Lee had recently become agitated. Naruto's life, Hanada's abuse from her family, Shino's lack of human contact, Haku's childhood, the team had shared the majority of their stories, tying them together as more than just teammates. They were brothers in arms, and what affected one affected the others. Lee felt a similar sense of camaraderie with his new team. Then came Tenten's new test, which gradually pushed Lee over the edge the more he thought about it. When Lee's kata reached its peak, something snapped inside of him, an anger he knew he had to channel somewhere. Some strange. Power surged within Lee, vaguely resembling something he couldn't quite recall, and with a war cry Lee smacked his Quan Dao on the ground. The results stunned Lee as well. Not only did his weapon shatter, but the ground he landed on. Shattered. Lee created a crater in an explosion of earth and dust by smashing his polearm into the ground. Slowly, he turned to face his sensei, who had the same shocked expression as him. Zabuza had witnessed a lot in his life. 
He'd seen the power of Sandame Mizukic, he'd stood in front of Sandame Hokage's full key, he'd been pushed back by a bloody 13-year-old brat, though the spars that followed that event were good enough that Zabuza would lose all over again if he had to, he'd seen a lot of power and strength. But this surprised him. Sure, Naruto could do the same thing, but Lee wasn't Naruto. Lee did not even employ chakra. What landed on the ground was pure physical strength. Strong enough to carve a crimson crater. What was it with him getting all the super-powered brats, Zabuza wondered deep within his mind. Naruto dashed out of the hidden house, his and Anko's advanced senses easily picking up on the shockwave. In case of a surprise attack, Anko chose to hide in the shadows behind Naruto. Of course, no one expected to see a stunned Lee and a similarly stunned Zabuza. Worried for a moment that they would be hit with a genjutsu, Naruto used the Kai technique to free them, but it had no effect. Slowly Zabuza turned to Naruto. That's all I've got, brat. I'm no longer training anyone, and I'm fleeing this place. Every brat I've met since I met you becomes super-powered in a bloody week. Naruto gradually calmed down Zabuza and Lee, or at least restored Lee to his normal, flames of youth, state. Naruto did something unexpected again after Zabuza explained what had happened. He grinned widely and smacked Lee on the back. Lee, you did it. I knew you'd do it. Of course, Lee was perplexed as to what he did, especially since it sounded quite important. What did I do, Naruto-kun? All I remember was fanning my youthful flames with some basic exercises, cue cough by Zabuza at the simple, exercises asterisk, when suddenly I felt my youthfulness surpass everything I had felt before and before I knew it, I had broken my youthful weapon on the ground. Naruto laughed a little at Lee's explanation before responding to the assembled team, because Lee's crater creation pretty much called everyone who was still resting in her room a tenton. Do you know what a chakra is, Lee? Chakra is simply a combination of spiritual and physical energy, correct? You cannot create chakra, but that does not mean you lack spiritual or physical energy. In fact, both reserves are truly massive in comparison to our peers. Now comes the exciting part. Because chakras are made of both types of energy, they are very simple to use and control. However, both energies are diluted in some ways, making them much less effective than they should be, despite being easier to use. Because you can't use chakra, I had a revolutionary theory. If you were pushed far enough, whether physically, mentally, or emotionally, you would be able to harness and control raw physical energy, in my opinion. Something that only you are capable of doing. While most shinobi find it difficult, if not impossible, to use physical and spiritual energy separately, you are an exception. Most ninja will use their chakra to find their power within because it is easily accessible. You, on the other hand, lack chakra, so if you pushed hard enough, you'd be able to access the separate energies. Lee, while you can still use ninjutsu, you now have a power greater than that. While you'll never be able to spit fire or control water, do you think you'll need it if you get physically stronger than Tsunade, tougher than me, and faster than Haku? The revelations had everyone gaping. Kuranai, as a genjutsu expert, and Hanada, as a Hayuga, were much more knowledgeable about chakra. What Naruto proposed was both insane and plausible. It would be extremely difficult to use physical energy, but as Naruto suggested, physical energy becomes diluted when mixed with spiritual energy, making it much less effective. If Naruto was correct, Lee had just opened up a whole new perspective on chakra and its origins. It could also explain why Tsunade possessed physical strength that no one else possessed. She must have discovered a way to either use physical energy or affect the chakra mixture, reducing the presence of spiritual energy to near zero, which was possible given Tsunade's mastery of chakra control. If Naruto was correct, Lee was a genius, no, a prodigy never before seen. Kiba approached Lee, looked him in the eyes, and spoke. Lee, you've proven yourself to be a true prodigy. I must admit that I'm envious of how strong you're all becoming. But if you think I'm going to give up, you're wrong. Lee, 
You better learn to use your physical energy wisely or I'm going to beat you up. Everyone laughed at Kiba, knowing that it was his way of saying, good job, while also issuing a rivalry challenge. Lee gave Kiba a friendly smile before standing up and shaking hands. Yosh. Kiba Kun. We're now competitors. Our youthful flames will burn brightly. Lee and Kiba both smirked at each other. Kiba had also been practicing when Lee's shockwave hit him and Akamaru. While his sister Hannah mocked him and Akamaru, Kiba knew he could and would be stronger than her. The only thing left to do is to force that potential out. Knowing that his family's taijutsu would not suffice in the specialties he had chosen, he knew he needed to diversify his combat abilities. So he asked Kuranai to get him a chakra testing paper, which revealed he had a strong affinity for lightning. Kiba had spent a significant amount of time learning elemental recomposition after Naruto had shown him the fundamentals of lightning manipulation. But he didn't stop there. Kiba aspired to be like his father, who was said to be able to use ninjutsu through his nin dog. Of course, he knew he was nowhere near that level, but that didn't stop him from trying. What he discovered, on the other hand, was that while Akamaru couldn't channel ninjutsu from Kiba, he could use chakra. What was more intriguing was that Akamaru shared the same element as Kiba. Because the puppy lacked Kiba's reserves, Akamaru couldn't really use any jutsu higher than D rank. Kiba had also begun looking for a suitable weapon, with two options so far. He discovered a pair of clawed gauntlets in the armory, weapons that allowed him to defend as well as attack, and they were very similar to his clan's jutsu. His attention was drawn to a pair of chain-linked kama, on the other hand. He knew how powerful Shino's deadly kama could be after sparring with them, and the chain would aid him in capturing an enemy alive. Not to mention the combinations he could pull off with lightning chakra and a chain. In the end, he chose both so that even if Naruto only improved one of them, he'd have the other as backup in case he needed it. So Kiba spent a lot of time every day practicing both weapons, employing some of the tricks Tenten had shared with the team for switching between styles. So Kiba would spend hours in the dojo, rushing through the dummies and attacking them with kicks, claws, and chained kama, unleashing a torrent of attacks on the unfortunate dummies. Akamaru, on the other hand, was learning how to better channel his chakra while also increasing his meager reserves. It wasn't easy for the puppy, but if his partner was willing to push himself to the limit, so should he. After all, the two of them were a team. Shino and Haku, on the other hand, were having the closest thing to a date Shino could think of. While the poor bug user had accepted his feelings for Haku, and Haku had admitted she felt something for him as well, he was terribly ignorant of what a date is. His bumbling made Haku laugh all the time, his attempts to woo her failing so miserably that she thought he was cute. Despite his shortcomings in the dating department, she could see he was genuinely interested in her, which was a definite plus. Besides, she knew he liked her because he had already done things for her that he wouldn't do for anyone else. The issue was determining where she stood with him. Meanwhile, countless Naruto clones were collaborating with a certain perverted sage. The sage had assigned some of them to learn the fundamentals of Rasengan, knowing that the chakra exercise alone would be invaluable to Naruto. Another group of clones was working on seals and ideas, while the last section was assisted in using said seals by the aged Senen. Nearly 20 clones were working on the Sandame's armor alone, others preparing Lee's future weapon for use. Jiraiya had no time to do his research because Naruto had managed to overload him. Then again, the aged ninja reasoned, what he was doing with Naruto was far more interesting than research. Jiraiya was astounded by the genin's talent with sealing, which ranged from elemental seals to reverse gravity seals to advanced storage seals to storage with storage seals. The week passed us by. The team never stopped practicing and improving. The aged Hokage came and visited the group near the end of the week, as if he didn't know where they were. Naruto summoned him, Jiraiya, Hinata, and Tenten to the armory's second room, where they could talk without interruption. When Naruto returned inside, 
He told the Sandame what had happened to Tenten and sought ways to protect her from the council's greed. To say the Hokage was upset is an understatement. The old man was already struggling to have Naruto sent to root or executed. With Tenten attracting more attention, it would be extremely difficult to keep the council in check. Until Naruto came up with an idea. How about this, Gigi? Muramasa's techniques and relics, as well as how to make others like him, will be listed as Namikaze clan techniques and relics. Tenten would become a retainer for my clan because I was going to reveal my heritage to the village anyway. If Sasuke wants the sword or, God forbid, Tenten, he'll have to fight her or me one on one. Something he has no chance of winning, believe me. If they want to marry her off to a clan, they must go through me because she will be a retainer for my clan. Finally, I had Aero Senen investigate the council with some of my infiltration assistants. We discovered a root underground headquarters, which, combined with my and Inoichi testimony sends about what happened five years ago, would easily lead to the asshole's conviction. Of course the council won't take it easy but you can convict them for being accomplices. GG. I know you're tired and all, but these assholes are tearing Konoha apart. Sure. I don't feel the same way I used to, but that doesn't mean I don't care about people like you and Tenten or Hina-chan. I'll protect Konoha as long as you're here and it's important to you. GG, you may have to retire soon, or find a Hokage replacement. We need someone who can and will stand up to the councils. The old man sighed, revealing his age. Naruto was correct in everything but he couldn't simply stand up and execute some council members because of the demon brat's words. While he agreed, he knew the civilians would not, and this would cause a lot of trouble. Of course, you know what the civilians will do, Naruto-kun. GG. I mean, screw the civilians. What have they done to you that hasn't already worn you down? What have they accomplished for Konoha? Nothing. They're destroying the place. Furthermore, once I reveal the true cause of the Kiyubi's attack, as well as my heritage, they will worship me as much as they do the Uchiha. Sheep fucking sheep. Tenten simply had to step in at that point. Um, Naruto, what do you mean about your ancestors, and what is the reason for Kiyubi's attack? Naruto simply smiled at her. You'll have to learn along with the rest of this fucked up village. But believe me when I say that a lot will change. A clan will be disgraced, while another will appear to rise to prominence. It will not be pleasant, but it is necessary. Now Tenten, could you flare your yukai a bit for Gigi to see? I need his thoughts on the matter. Tenten complied to Naruto's command, letting the Hokage see the powerful energy that now flowed in her along with her chakra. The red and black aura erupted around her like a double helix, one helix soft blue chakra, the other red and black. Serutobi was taken aback when he saw the power now hidden within the petite Kunoichi. He did, however, notice how quickly she tired. Tenten's yukai was mostly made of highly compressed chakra, so it was natural for her to tire out quickly. Still, if revealed at the right time, it could be a real game changer. Jiraiya stepped in, revealing that he had created a seal that concealed Tenten's secondary chakra coils from the Byakugan ensuring that no one found out before it was too late. Tenten then exited the room, allowing the shinobi inside to discuss matters she wasn't aware of. Naruto stood up and displayed his modified battle armor to Sandame. It now had a lot more metal on it, with a breastplate to protect him as well as a lot of leather and metal in other places to protect Serutobi's most vulnerable points. Naruto then began to explain. Gigi's armor is one of a kind. I'll explain as I go through the process of donning. The jumpsuit underneath is now worn at skin level, covering your entire body. You should have noticed that it has dark gray lines running through it, right? This was a collaborative effort between myself, Jiraiya, and Hinaheim. The lines are actually a slew of seals aligned to your chakra coils, improving chakra flow and shielding you in almost every way. On the back of the suit is a large seal array that, 
for lack of a better term, serves as a combat medic. It detects and responds to damage and threats to your body by releasing chemicals. It contains anti-venoms, nutrients, combat chemicals, painkillers, and everything else. I've also placed a couple of chakra storing arrays to provide you with the extra boost you'll need for a long fight. Now we'll look at the leather protections. The leather is actually two layers of leather with a steel fiber weave underneath. Chakra reactive seals ensure that they can be hardened to the hardness of a steel plate if necessary. The steel plates I've added go over the leather. Because I know you have a lot of jutsu of both elements, the greaves and boots have advanced storage seals filled with water and mud. A small burst of chakra will release the required amount, ready for use. The bracers are adorned with a slew of seals. I have a large amount of weaponry inside, mostly for storing seals. First and foremost, there are the wrist blades on top of your wrist. They aren't much of a weapon, but they have storage seals that hold large amounts of poison, and they're mostly used for hidden strikes. Explosives and other clever tricks are hidden beneath and to the sides of the bracers. I have explosive pellets, smoke pellets, poison smoke pellets, flash pellets, and anything else you can think of. By the way, I've already hidden a slew of kanai with explosive tags behind your belt. That was a nasty surprise. Anyway, those are the gauntlets. Your helm. That's a work of art. I've placed chakra sensing seals so you can tell if an enemy is following you or if a powerful jutsu is being prepared. A chakra releasing seal is linked to it, and when placed on you, it will blast any genjutsu away. The visor and mask completely cover your face while filtering out any harmful agents, ensuring that smoke and airborne poisons do not affect you. Finally, aside from the regular strengthening seals, your breastplate has only one array. The magnetic shield array is my pride and joy. In short, it locks away a portion of your chakra, approximately 1%, to form a powerful magnetic shield around you. Anything metallic or ferrous that comes close to you will be deflected. If you need more power, you can consciously focus more chakra into it, increasing the barrier's range and strength. Otherwise, you can instruct it to cover only one direction if necessary. Naruto took a deep breath to replenish the oxygen he had depleted while explaining the armor. He went on to say. Finally, the entire armor is sealed away in the form of a necklace. Unfortunately, using it will shred all of your clothes, but it could be a nasty surprise if you have to hide it. I have over a thousand explosive pellets and tags, as well as over 200 smoke pellets, not including the poison smoke pellets. Thanks to Anko Ne Chan, Aero Senen and I have enough poisons inside to take on a battalion of Junin and win. However, there are some drawbacks. First and foremost, despite its immense power, it is still only an armor. In other words, try to avoid Gigi. I haven't tried it against someone like Kusanagi, so I believe you'll have to. You'll also need to wear the armor for a few days to allow it to align with you and store your chakra. That's all I've got. Did I forget anything, Hina-chan and Aero Senen? Jiraiya laughed as Hinata shook her head. The Gaki just passed off the creation of the most powerful armor as if it were nothing more than a casual conversation about the weather. However, the fact remained that he had forgotten something. Actually, you did. The storage seal, as well as an elemental array for wind, are located on the soles of the boots. When you use that seal, Sensei, a blast of wind will erupt, propelling you away. The same arrays can be found on the front of the gloves as well as the back side of the armor. This should help you avoid some more obstacles. Naruto nodded to Jiraiya, having forgotten about these seals, which he had applied almost immediately after receiving the armor. Serutobi was just staring at the armor in front of him. Simplistic in appearance, deceptively light but insanely strong. He slowly began to examine it, hoping it wasn't just a genjutsu. Sure, he was old, but he was still a shinobi, and getting new equipment is something all shinobi enjoy. Especially high-quality equipment. 
Serutobi had just realized that the term, high grade, didn't even apply to this marvel. No, it appeared that Naruto required a completely new scale on his own. However, the kid had discovered a way to create electricity from raw chakra, which should indicate how good Naruto truly was. The old Hokage chuckled. He was stupid for not recognizing Naruto's brilliance. Well, Naruto-kun, Jiraiya-chan, and Hanada-kun, I believe a reward is in order, as you must have all worked tirelessly to complete this on time. It truly is the greatest suit of armor ever worn by a cage, and I am honored that you have allowed me to use it. I can't imagine how much time you must have spent on it. Naruto rubbed the back of his neck, and Hanada blushed at the compliment. Naruto wrapped his other hand around Hanada, pleased with the compliments she was receiving. He then continued to make Hanada blush a new shade of red in adoration. Yes, it was extremely difficult. Hanada-chan had to remember the location of each tenketsu on your body and then replicate it here, as well as the shape, form, and size of your chakra coils. Not to mention that it had to be done perfectly in order for the entire array to be effective. The implications of the statement made the elderly cage wide-eyed. It meant she'd gotten close enough to him to remember every detail, but it also spoke volumes about her skill with the Byakugan. It demonstrated why Neji's humiliating performance in the Chunin exams came as no surprise to her team. Naruto and the others exited the room to allow Sandame to properly put on the armor. After a few moments, the cage emerged, fully armored from head to toe. The jumpsuit was made of an elastic material to fit his aging body, and the metal was surprisingly light despite being clearly not fragile. Naruto grinned, and you could see the grin behind the Sandame mask. The month passed slowly as everyone grew more confident in their abilities. Lee was now training harder than ever, and his new Quan Dai was an important part of his fighting style. It was a truly magnificent weapon, and every time Tenten saw it, she was filled with greed. The blade on top appeared to emerge from the roaring head of a dragon, with the kanji for dragon written on it. When striking the enemy, the spiked egg on the bottom of the blade was just as lethal. What's the reason? Naruto's latest seals. He had compressed the steel to the point where he had 300 kilograms, 660 pounds of steel in the same size and shape. It didn't weigh as much because Naruto and Jiraiya collaborated on gravity seals that reduced weight rather than increasing it. Of course, the momentum generated was still insane, but Lee was anything but normal, successfully wielding the weapon despite the insane force generated. Lee had also begun developing his own fighting style, Ryukin or Dragon Fist, primarily due to Naruto's insistence that it sounded cool. Lee was capable of feats that would stun any shinobi if he used raw physical, or in a couple of cases spiritual, energy. Lee, on the other hand, stated that he had only mastered one attack, a powerful spinning kick known as Dragon Tail. Why did he know he'd mastered it? His kick actually broke the sound barrier, sending shockwaves of force even though it didn't land. Needless to say, being hit by that kick resulted in an instant ko for almost any opponent. The group dubbed Lee Ryushin, Dragon God, because of his fighting style. Tenten had also made significant progress with her weapons, being able to hit targets in any direction and at any speed. She could easily make her thrown weapons rebound and hit a target in a blind spot by utilizing existing obstacles. That, however, paled in comparison to her mastery of the black sword, Muramasa. She quickly grew in terms of speed and strength after being thrown into Naruto's, buckle up or die, training regime. Her fighting style when using Muramasa consisted of quick attacks, focusing on the fact that the blade is mostly unblockable. Taking a page from Naruto's book, she had also begun practicing ninjutsu, just in case. What she discovered astounded her. If she recomposed her chakra into an element before leaking it to Muramasa's coil, it would retain its elemental properties, becoming much stronger than the original in some cases. As a result, she had practiced a lot since discovering that her elemental affinity was fire, though she was showing signs of developing a wind one, which was still far out of her reach. 
Nonetheless, she was quickly developing into a formidable swordmaster, fit for her sword Muramasa. Because Muramasa was a demonic sword and Tenten was his master, the group dubbed him Makan no Tenten, Tenten of the Devil Sword. Kiba had learned a lot of things, including stealth from Haku, enemy appraisal from Zabuza, tactics from Shino, and obviously sparring from Naruto and Anko. Naruto had improved both of Kiba's weapons. His Kama were now linked by an adjustable chain, and he had seals that allowed him to control real lightning with his chakra. His claws were also improved, and he could store a variety of items inside a few storage seals on the gauntlets for quick use. Kiba made several leaps in his skill as the month progressed, now that he had someone to help him improve. Kiba spent a lot of time reworking several lightning jutsu Naruto. Liberated from the shinobi library to fit himself and his fighting style, Ryu Kami, Lying Wolf. He enhanced his attacks with both his own lightning affinity and the true lightning generating features of his weapon, allowing him to pierce almost any barrier. Kiba attempted to imitate Yandaimi's Shunshin technique at first, but discovered that it was impossible without seal mastery. Instead, he considered using electricity and lightning chakra to increase his speed in short bursts. It would have worked, but Hanada stopped him, telling him that even the slightest overuse of the technique would fry his nerves, rendering him immobile for the rest of his life. To fix this, she had Naruto make Kiba a pair of greaves that would regulate and limit the chakra that passed through him. Kiba gave his new movement technique the name Inazuma Gari, Lightning Flash Hunt. While Kiba did gain high speeds while using it, he was still only as fast as Haku's Makio Hiyosho in short bursts. It was still extremely beneficial to the aspiring Oinin. With Kiba's speed and new weapons, he was clearly no longer dead last. Instead, he had become a serious shinobi intent on defending his pack. Woe betide those who enraged Kiba, as the team had discovered that his temper made him more powerful rather than sloppy. Kiba's jutsu and manner earned him the moniker Ikazuki no Ukami, Lightning Wolf, like his fighting style. Shino's abilities may not have skyrocketed like those of the new member, but that didn't mean he lacked. Instead, Kurenai and Anko pushed him to his limits, forcing him to become stronger, faster, tougher, and more skilled with his Kama. Shino's reserves had also increased slightly, allowing him to use the occasional genjutsu, which could be extremely dangerous due to his own prowess. While he was not a Kama master, he was on par with most Chunin and even a couple of Junin. When he used his insect allies, he transformed into someone you didn't want to meet on the battlefield. What's the reason? Shino was able to train some of his colony members to use poisonous bites with the assistance of Anko and his own father. A few poisonous bites aren't dangerous, but 100 to 200 poisonous insects biting maniacally and transmitting neurotoxins. That's not a good thing. Shino's original technique of using his insects to form a dome around him, allowing him to detect attacks even in his blind spots, had now been greatly expanded. He had to, or Haku would have beaten him to death with her new sword. Speaking of Haku, she'd figured out how to use her new katana to lethal effect, especially when combined with her Makio Hiyosho, Wind Affinity, and the extremely useful chain on the other side. The chain could quickly wrap around an enemy, immobilizing him before Haku moved in for the kill or incapacitate hit. While Haku's ninjutsu repertoire hadn't grown significantly, the extra chakra stored within her blade was a definite plus, allowing Haku to unleash frozen death on her enemies for much longer. Not to mention that the Zabuza Naruto Anko combination in charge of the training regime had done wonders for the Kunoichi. She was now faster, stronger, and more endurance than she had ever been. Anko had spent a lot of time training with Naruto, becoming more familiar with her body and gradually becoming more powerful. Her lightning fast strikes would now leave any opponent reeling due to the fact that her combos never ended. With her natural flexibility, which was enhanced by her keke jenke, her insane speed, and her reflexes that were sharper than ever, she flowed from attack to attack like water, never giving the enemy the slightest chance to counterattack. Anko's ninjutsu had also improved. With her increased chakra reserves and control, she was able to learn the jutsu she had always desired, 
making her even more lethal. She still had issues with Kyuubi's Yukai, primarily because she couldn't stop attacking while under its influence. Kyuubi had told her that her DNA wasn't as unstable as Naruto's, which meant she could channel a little more than Naruto without becoming overwhelmed by Yukai. Kuranai had finally gotten Naruto's long-awaited gift. A wine-red battle kimono that is impervious to tearing and other elemental attacks. The same magnetic shield array that protected Serutobi's armor ensured that the red-eyed Junin would not be as easy a target as she used to be. The flight feature on her back took some getting used to, but Kuranai could use it in combat. So long as Futen techniques are avoided. The wings were made of a lightweight metallic skeleton, reinforced cloth, and a few seals that generated wind from chakra. Kuranai's genjutsu list had also grown as a result of Kiyubi's teachings, allowing her to attack in ways that not even a Sharingan could match. Kuranai's control had improved even more as a result of the exercises, to the point where she could now easily use some high-leveled ninjutsu. Of course, the fact that Zabuza and Anko worked her to the ground alongside the rest of the group could have played a role. Zabuza had also put in the effort, sparring with Anko when he couldn't spar with Naruto. Being in Konoha had also helped the once-missing Nin grow into using techniques other than Sweden and expand his own repertoire. One of his favorite attacks, surprisingly, was made by Hanada, the powerful Sweden, Santoruden no Jutsu, water style, triple-headed dragon blast technique, an attack that dwarfed his own water dragon. He was also pleased whenever Hanada or anyone else used something he had taught them or helped them create. He briefly wondered if senseis felt this way when teaching their students, but ultimately decided he didn't care what he felt, just that it was nice. He could do without the occasional pranks Naruto, Anko, and Hanada played on him. He still shuddered when he saw them speaking with those irritating grins on their faces. Hanada had grown in all of her areas of interest. Her medical ninjutsu were good enough to use in battle, and her Jiyuken was improving with all the spars she had gotten in. Hanada had also improved her sweet and affinity, even inventing her own ninjutsu and teaching it to her sensei. She was well aware that she lacked his chakra, but she more than made up for it with her insane affinity for water. Even with all of his years of practice, Zabuza's affinity surpassed his own. Of course, Hanada was modest about the fact, still blushing from the compliment. But she had to admit that seeing her jutsu in action gave the young Hayuga a great sense of accomplishment. If only her clan had recognized that such changes were welcome, they would have been so much better as a whole. Hanada had also begun to incorporate Genjutsu into her repertoire, making her a well-rounded, adaptable, and thus powerful Kunoichi. Woe betide the fools who irritated her when it was her time of the month. She had broken many of Anko's bones when she made the wrong comment at the wrong time. Of course, when she realized what she had done, she almost broke down, but the message was clear. Hayuga Hanada is strong, independent, and not someone you want to mess with. Hanada had begun training to replicate Tsunade's technique after being taken aback by the strength she had demonstrated. Of course, it was nothing like Tsunade, aside from the fact that it used a different focus than Tsunade. Hanada used medical chakra on her muscles for a short period of time to increase efficiency, mimicking Lee's gates to a limited extent while also gathering a mass of chakra at the point of impact. She could attack in an instant thanks to her enhanced muscles, and the chakra gathered on her palm or tanfa would explode on impact, shattering everything it came into contact with. Hanada's ability to do this in an instant, let alone split her attention between two very delicate processes, spoke volumes about her control. With constant sparring with his group members, Jiraiya's teachings, quality time with Hanada, and his own sealing inventions, Naruto was worked to the bone. However, this had a number of positive consequences. Naruto was well on his way to finding a way to remove and replace the caged bird seal with Jiraiya's assistance and Hanada sneaking into her clan's compound to retrieve the notes on the caged bird seal. The new seal was finished, but if he wanted the Hayuga to change, he'd have to remove the caged bird seal first. He'd also completed another seal, based on his father's Hiraishin Kanai. It was a tattoo of summoning. 
The owner of one such tattoo could use it to summon any other owner of the same tattoo to his location. Of course, it was still limited by chakra expenditure, but being able to summon his team to himself in a time of need was worth it. Zabuza, Anko, Kuranai, Haku, Team 8, and the Hokage had all gotten one of these tattoos, but Jiraiya had politely declined. He'd also changed his outfit. He was now dressed in black pants with red tribal designs and a shirt that showed just enough of his muscled arms while unzipped just enough to reveal the muscle underneath. Naruto's shirt was partially hidden by a black vest that was completely unzipped. What was important though, was the trench coat he had gotten his hands on. The background was blood red and orange flames, with the words first maelstrom written in red on the back and an orange fox surrounding the kanji. Numerous seals were of course employed on the items, mostly to prevent them being destroyed due to Naruto's wild fighting style and sudden, radical transformations. Naruto was now lying on Hinata's lap after a romantic picnic followed by a makeout session. Naruto thought Hinata looked like an angel with the sun setting behind her. Slowly, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a small box. He was pleased to see Hinata's face light up when she saw a ring with an amethyst on it when he handed it to her. Naruto gave a soft laugh. I know we're too young to marry or anything, but I couldn't stop myself when I saw it. I thought you'd like it so, I bought it for you Haim. Hope you like it. Hinata leaned and kissed Naruto before giving her reply. It looks beautiful Naruto-kun, thank you. It's fantastic. When the date ended, Hinata practically skipped the rest of the day before going to bed. When she entered her room, she spotted a beautiful battle kimono lying on her bed with a small note on it, saying, now you will look like the princess you really are no matter where. I hope you like it. Hinata, of course, recognized Naruto's writing and blushed a new shade of red before putting it on. It was a soft lavender color with white flower depictions on the lower hem. The cloth was cut on her shoulders and, with its neck cut, emphasized her cleavage. Her chest was guarded by a simple, light breastplate that did not detract from its elegance, and it was also adorned with flower depictions. The kimono's lower hem ended above her knees, exposing her legs without being slutty, simply elegant. The sash she was wearing as a belt already had a spot for her trusted tonfa. While the fabric was very light, it was slightly stiffer than usual, despite the fact that it looked and felt like silk. She noticed some notes on her new dress on the back of the card. The cloth was improved like Kuranai's own battle kimono, while possessing some secret features made specifically for Hinata to find, according to the mysterious admirer, as if she didn't know who it was. Hinata noticed the kimono fit her perfectly and made a mental note to ask Naruto how he was able to get her exact measurements. Hinata laughed as she danced around in her new kimono, admiring its simple beauty. She laughed some more before falling asleep soundly. Naruto, for his part, smiled at the moon before retiring to his home for the month. Aside from that, the Chunin exams were the next day, and he'd need everything he had. No. Not for Neji, but for Gara. He knew the boy was unstable but extremely powerful. They'd almost certainly meet in the finals. Naruto sighed slightly before falling asleep, Hanada's scent still lingering on his clothes. Daybreak arrived, and the group dressed, with the girls admiring Hanada's new dress, and had a hearty breakfast. Given the amount of food consumed, it would be considered a feat fit for a king. The group moved out of the place that had become their home for the past month, their weapons secured in seal or sheath. Naruto and Anko shuddered involuntarily as they were greeted by a sun surrounded by a rainbow ring. The snake coiled around the sun, a beautiful but foreboding omen. They exchanged glances, gaining strength from one another before setting out for the village. That's it for today. If you enjoy this video, give it a big thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more awesome stories like this. Thank you. See you all in my next video.